Hey there, good morning everybody and welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber and thanks for joining us. We are going to Ada County, Idaho, where we are learning that opening statements are expected Monday for the trial of doomsday cult mom, Lori Vallow Daybell. Now, as we know, Daybell is charged in the deaths of her son, JJ Vallow, daughter, Tylee Ryan, along with the death of her husband, Chad Daybell's first wife, Tammy Daybell. Now, if convicted, the doomsday cult mom faces life in prison, so there's a lot at stake here. We know that lawyers on both sides have spent this week narrowing down the jury pool, and our very own Gigi McKinney, Kelvy joins us live right now from outside the Ada County Courthouse in Idaho with the very latest. Gigi, you have been there. You are our eyes and ears about what is happening in jury selection. And you and I spoke before we got on today. Yesterday was a bit of a different day, wasn't it, right? In terms of the number of people who were questioned and responded about their knowledge of the case. That seemed to be a central issue yesterday. It was. It was very different than Monday and Tuesday, where most of the excusals were based on hardships, just financial, work-based, uh, caregiver-based, that kind of thing. But yesterday, we had a big increase in people who knew sometimes small details, and then uh, some, some would say they didn't know much at all. And then as questioning progressed, you find out they knew a whole lot, like the last name of Chad or that they were in Hawaii. And so we saw numerous people excused yesterday just on their knowledge of the case from pre-trial publicity. Were any of them allowed in, even if they knew about the case? Did any of them say, listen, I, I know about the case, but I can go forward nonetheless, and they were, they passed muster and went to the next phase? There were a couple that knew some very basic things, but it seems like the more you knew, if you knew there was a dead spouse involved, if you knew that the kids were found in Chad's backyard, those were the ones they got rid of because that's a little bit more prejudicial, I guess, knowing that going in. But for the most part, uh, if, if they knew more than just a little bit, they were just excusing them. And then there were a couple that they kept on that kind of surprised me. Mm. Let, I want to get more into the jurors, but, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by Lori Vallow, right? So we don't have cameras are not allowed in that courtroom, so we can't see what she's re responding to, what she looks like. There are these courtroom sketches that sort of give us an idea of what's happening. And I understand there was a sketch of an image of Lori maybe wiping her eyes at one point. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the sketch artist put out a, a drawing, and this apparently came when they were discussing with the jurors that they would see gruesome photos that were autopsy pictures and, and talking about maybe body parts and, and things of that nature. And the sketch artist saw her put a tissue to her eye and wipe her eyes. We don't know if it was allergies or if she was emotional. We can't see that close on the screen that we have in the jury or in the overflow room, rather. Uh, we can tell it's Lori, but we, we can't see that close. The box is very small. At one point yesterday, I did personally see her do the same. Mm. She wiped her eyes, but then immediately after turned and was talking to her attorney. So it's hard to tell if she's emotional or just maybe having a little drippy eye issue. Mm. And, and, and is that maybe the most emotion you've seen from her so far? Because look, from the video that we do have of Lori Vallow Daybell, in earlier proceedings, she was laughing, and we know there was an issue of competency. So it becomes a question of really what is going on in her mind. But you had said to me that she seemed very attentive during these proceedings. She's speaking with her attorney. She's jotting down notes. Was that more of the same yesterday? Actually, a little more yesterday, in my opinion. She seemed to write a whole lot more. Uh, she talked to both attorneys more often. It seems to me that she talks to John Thomas a little more than she does Jim Archibald. Yesterday, it was definitely a healthy mix between those two. And I think also uh, she was looking over their shoulders sometimes as they would write on their legal pads, and then she would respond to them apparently about what they had written. So, yeah, she's very involved. It's very different than what we've seen in the past. At yeah. her arraignment, way back last year she did show emotion a couple of times uh, some of it was very subtle and, and some of it was wiping of the eyes but yeah she just seems like a very different Lori Vallow to me this week just in game mode focused mode and, and very much participating in her own defense let's go back to the jurors so I understand one juror might have had an issue with the sensitivity of graphic photos because we know when we're talking about the deaths of two children and also the death of Tammy Daybell, which we're still not entirely sure what the, the results of that exclamation. I'm not even going to, I can't pronounce that word. For whatever reason, I can't pronounce that word. But you get what I'm saying, when her body was exhumed and further an analyzed. But th this is going to be a tough case. And did you get a sense uh, from this one woman that she might not be able to handle this? 
Yeah, she made really clear to both parties that she had a sensitivity to blood. She said as a kid, she would pass out when mm. she saw blood. Now, as an adult, it makes her very nauseous. And if she was watching TV and it shows blood, she hides her eyes. So Lori's attorney, John Thomas, said that's not an option here. You have to look at these photos. And so the state was asking, can you still be objective if you look at these photos? And she really was trying hard to be fair and said, well, I can try. Ultimately, they let her go because it's it's a necessary necessary evil in this case you have to look at, at photos of these dead children and Tammy Daybell. Listen, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. You can even select a jury who thinks they might be able to handle it. And during the course of the proceedings, one juror could raise their hand and be like, I can't do this anymore. And they're going to be excused. So that's why, um, and let's just be clear about this, Gigi. How many jurors do we have right now? And how many jurors are the goal? You know, actual jurors versus alternates. Give us an idea of where we're at and what we're trying to get to. Well, we, we ended the day with uh, 39, so we need three more. And we were down to the last three jurors, Jesse, and we were all kind of thinking, let's just do this. And then that first one was let go. The judge brought in the other two together and let them go just based on answers on the questionnaire. So that was during the individual questioning about mm. media exposure. So we need three, and then we get to the, the next phase, which is each side has 12 strikes to use. And then after that, we have openings on Monday. So we're, we're moving along here. I'm curious to see if we finish up and get those three today. Okay. And let me ask you this. So, so again, how many alternates are we looking at? Six alternates. Six alternates. Sitting, obviously, and then six, six alternates. Okay. That scares me a bit. Eight, eight, eight weeks. We had, we had six alternates in Alec Murdoch, and by the end, we had one. We were down to one. So it's a yeah. little nerve-wracking thinking this could be an eight-week trial. That's a good point. And we were getting to the end of that trial, the Alec Murdoch trial. We are wondering if this was even going to be able to be finished. Now, I understand that there was another juror who, whose wife is kind of into this case or maybe is like a true crime enthusiast and that became an issue. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it gave us a little laugh there in the overflow room. So they were questioning him about one thing they ask is, has any of your answers changed from when you filled out your questionnaire last week? And he said, yes, or he didn't sign his affirmation is what it was. And they asked why. And he said, well, my, my wife's a true crime junkie. And we all started laughing. And he said, so she told me on Monday how many jurors were passed through to the next round and then told me other things about the case. And it, he didn't really elaborate on what other things. So they let him go. But it was uh, we all said now he's going to need a good divorce attorney after <laughs> tough this jury potentially <laughs> I, well i hope not um and then the jurors you mentioned to me earlier in the week that they range in terms of experience uh their backgrounds but also age are there older jurors is that becoming an issue because you talked about an eight-week trial very difficult subject matter talk about age if you can well, yesterday was the first time uh, Mr. Thomas uh, just directly addressed one female juror who I, I don't like the word elderly. I like to say a veteran at this thing called living life. I like and that. I like that better. I like that better, Gigi. Yeah, that, right, I'm going to yeah. use that from now on. Uh, he, yeah, and, and he said, ma'am, you know, you're, you're able to be excused from being on this jury just due to your age. And she said that she was happy to serve and that it would not be a hardship. And I think somebody like her would be great. She's lived a lot of life. She's seen a lot of things in her years here. So I'm curious to see if she's somebody they keep on. I think she could be very beneficial on this jury. And I'm surprised that these are jurors also that have families and children and they still feel they can be impartial in all of this. That's what they say. I mean, we I haven't maybe one or two have just flat out said I can't be impartial. Yeah. And one of those yesterday was another juror who said after looking at autopsy pictures, she didn't feel she could be fair with Lori's uh, case and she was let go. But for the most part, these people do say even if they have knowledge of the case, that they can be fair and impartial and, you know, would sit and listen to the evidence and make their decision based on that. I also want to be clear about something, Gigi. You mentioned the opening statements are going to happen Monday. The best that you can for, for me, for people who've been following this case from the beginning, the tentacles are so wide in how far this stretches. But how much is this jury going to hear about Lori Vallow Daybell? Are they going to know anything about Charles Vallow? I mean, are they going to know about these other instances? How much are they going to know about everything that was surrounding the life of Lori Vallow Daybell? How much is going to come into this? Um, and, and how much is going to be talked about, you know, Chad and Alex Cox and all that? 
you know, we really don't know. All the hearings pretty much have been off camera or, you know, the, the information coming out of those hearings have been very little. But it's hard to think that you're not going to hear about some of the circumstances surrounding Charles because it directly relates to this situation. It kind of is what snowballed everything that is the reason we're here. So we're all very curious as far as prior bad acts or, or things that, that came before the murder of the kids and Tammy is going to come in. I think it has to in some capacity to set the framework so that it's understandable for this jury. And I hope, for goodness sake, that the prosecution has a lot of visuals. There's so many yeah. players in this case. And I think we could lose them early on if they really don't know much when you're throwing these names out. It's very complex. And, and by the way, Charles Vallow was the uh, husband of um, Lori Vallow Daybell. Um, he died, uh, which was, you know, unusual circumstances to say the least. It was initial report of self-defense at the hands of Alex Cox, a shooting incident. But we know that Lori Vallow Daybell has been charged separately in Arizona in connection with Charles's death. And that will be a separate trial out in Arizona. But like you mentioned, it might come in here a bit. Uh, and Alex Cox, by the way, who is a central figure in this, arguably the person who may have actually killed the children, um, he is dead. He is dead, and that uh, creates a complication as well. Now, I want to ask you um, real quick about this, because as we're, I know you have to get back inside to focus a little bit more uh, on the case. Um, in, in terms of what we can expect from opening statements and how long they're going to be and how each side is going to present, do you have any sense of that as well? We really haven't heard anything about how long openings are going to take. Will there be a time limit on openings? We're pretty much in the dark, which is kind of where we've been for a while in this case uh, for the last few months. It'll be interesting to see how long they go, what they introduce. I think that the prosecution probably is going to come out swinging and, and really get this jury's attention, which I think is going to be uh, coming out and showing graphic things very yep. quickly to, to show them why we're here and then go from there. And, and we're waiting on this ruling also by by the judge about yep. Kay and Larry Woodcock, the grandparents of JJ, whether or not they can come in. Court actually doesn't resume until 1.30 today. They're doing some administrative things uh, behind closed doors. We're not able to watch that as far as I know. But 1.30 is when we resume jury selection today. I was going to ask you about that. Any word on who's going to be in the gallery, who's going to be permitted to be in the gallery? Because if they're also a witness in this case, that creates a complication. Well, we know that the four people that were mentioned last week were Kay and Larry Woodcock, who are the grandparents of JJ, Summer Shiflett, who is who is Lori Vallow's sister and a witness, and then her son Colby Ryan, who is her, her oldest child, who is living. And so the the judge or I'm sorry, the uh, the defense said the only person that they consider a victim in this case is Colby. Grandparents mm -hmm. and aunts and uncles under Idaho law doesn't fall under the status of victims. So that's what the argument is, is Kay and Larry, are they allowed to come in because they're witnesses after they testify when the statute says only, you know, grandparents and aunts and uncles are not victims. So it gets very confusing and, and that's the big ruling everybody following this case is waiting on. Pretty incredible when you think about this, and it's also pretty incredible that we are at the stages of the Lori Vallow Daybell trial, considering there was a question if it was even going to happen. But Gigi McKelvey, our eyes and ears, I will say it every day, you're really providing some great perspective on what is happening in that courtroom. Thank you so much, Gigi. All right, everybody, so we want you to stay with us because we are actually going to head now into the trial of Letitia Stauk on the other side of this break. You're watching Long Crime. I'm signing off. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this.